Welcome back to the French Rugby Podcast with me, Tim Groves, and ex-Scotland international and adopted Frenchman, Johnny BT. The Heineken Champions Cup is back with a bang, and we'll get a guest on shortly from one of the victorious French sides in round one, as well as chatting about some of the action and looking ahead to round two as well. How are you, Johnny? You were in cast at the weekend, weren't you? I was, mate. I was there for BT, and it was great. Um, not the great result that cast wanted, but it was great from a social perspective, although socially distant socializing, but great to catch up with so many ex teammates that are now part of the coaching staff and moving upstairs, running the club. There's now like four or five guys that I played with that have all taken up different roles. So Karen Aviongi cuts, um, yeah. while he's a total legend, tight head prop. He's still there. He's the scrum coach, Yannick Caballero, who was our seven and line out caller and weighed about 65 kgs <laughs> playing seven. Uh, Rory Cocker, Rodrigo Capo Ortega, Marc Antoine Rallier, um, just loads of guys that are transitioning well. Um, they stuck with the club and were able to have a socially distanced beer, um, which has been rare over the past 18 months to be working at a game and be able to catch up with mates for a beer. So no, it was really good, enjoyable. It was a good weekend of rugby, although results weren't the best as we would have hoped for the French sides, but I enjoyed my weekend. You're heading home as well, Johnny, aren't you? So is that all going to go ahead? Oh, I don't know. The Sturgeonator, Nicola Sturgeon, has announced some new measures today. Um, so flights are all good, and I think it's more just recommendations as opposed to laws. Um, the important bits, there's two weddings when I get back. One, my sister's getting married, and one of my best mates is getting married, not to each other. Um, a, a secondary wedding in Ireland. So just hoping that travel is still a gore, events aren't cancelled, and we can get home, celebrate Christmas, see family, and enjoy these weddings. So, yeah, we're heading home tomorrow. Um, which will be absolute carnage with three kids on two flights, but we'll make it through. We always do, Tim, and we'll look forward to unleashing those children on grandparents when we get home and getting some some quality time back. Jen and I, maybe some sleep um, and maybe a glass of wine somewhere. So looking forward to getting back to the, the sunny sights of Glasgow. Glad we're doing this today and not tomorrow then. You'd be in no fit state. <laughs> no, none at all. <laughs> Let's get into the Champions Cup then. And um, you mentioned it wasn't the best weekend for some of the French sides, but we'll start with the positives. Yep. How good were Racing on that first night? Ridiculous. Um, and that is taking into account the fact that they haven't been that great in the top 14. Um, Scrum has struggled in the top 14. Physicality has been an issue. Um, and they've played in fits and starts, but everything clicked against Northampton. They absolutely demolished them. Um, and Finn, my old mate Finn, was absolutely sensational. So... Look, when they play like that and when they get go-forward ball with that back line, they're so hard to stop. Like, Gail Fiku running through first-line defence and just, like, through George Furbank, like, he's not even there and setting up tries. Um, so when it all clicks and everything goes right, they are absolutely fantastic um, and a joy to watch. So that was a demolition of Northampton. And again, like, Finn, when he's running those angles, when he's targeting big props in between, like, Giller, uh, guard and pillar, and he's got him off and Kurtley Beale coming off his shoulders. He's just so difficult, so difficult to play against. Um, and Northampton couldn't cope with the physicality, with the pace, with the passes that were fizzing um, and the explosive nature of some of those racing backlines. So um, a huge win for them. Um, and yeah, demonstration really away from home. It was a great win. What did you make of the story around Antoine Dupont Co going up against the recruitment consultants, teachers, whatever they were of Cardiff? I loved it. Plumbers, mechanics. <laughs> the stuff dreams are made of, really, like especially when you're coming through as a youngster and you're an apprentice or semi-pro. But for these guys going back to their jobs on Monday after, you know, they've just played against Anton Dupont, the best player in the world. And yes, he might have made them look a bit silly, but what an experience. And the crowd absolutely loved it as well. That was the best bit. The ovation that they gave those Welsh players for the effort, especially the first 40 minutes where the first 25 minutes, I think they were leading up until 25, 26 minutes. Guts, determination, and it just shows there are so many different ways of winning rugby games um, and heart can take you so far. Um, so it was incredible to watch. I absolutely loved it. A great story. It's different as well compared to last year where these games would have been cancelled straight away. The fact that they can get these fixtures on, it's still great for spectators to watch because it's a different story and you can even more, more so back an underdog. So um, no, I absolutely loved it. I thought it was great for rugby um, and I really enjoyed watching the game. And a bit close from the scoreboard. We mentioned it last week. It looked like the tie of the round, Bordeaux, Leicester, leaders in the top 14, leaders in the premiership. Tigers just edged it, didn't they? Yes, I spoke to one of the boys in the Bordeaux camp today um, and he was pretty disappointed. I, I think as well, what they really battled with was the amount of kicks in the game. I think for spectators as well, it was 
a bit like t- watching tennis at some points. There were that many kicks, but for them and for Bordeaux, what that did was it removed the element of physicality that they're so used to imposing on people and they really battled with it. So I think it was something like 60 kicks for Leicester, 55 for Bordeaux, um, which is a lot of kicking in, in one game of Champions Cup rugby, especially when Bordeaux normally hold the ball and Leicester can be so good as well when they do hold ball. So um, spot on from the Leicester coaching staff from Borthwick. Um, they completely removed the physicality and that element from the game, which usually you'd think if they were going up against each other, Bordeaux would would dominate. Um, so no, it's a massive win for Leicester. Disappointing for Bordeaux, um, but a lesson for them in, in game management and maybe different ways of trying to win the game and how to be effective with their kicking strategy. So it wasn't the most enjoyable to watch. Disappointing for Bordeaux, but it's a huge win for Leicester. Did you see what happened with Harry Potter? I did, I did, <laughs> did the Ever seen anything like that before? <laughs> mate, it is... Again, Bordeaux, a lot we'll get into stadiums and the different stadiums were around European rugby, but Bordeaux, people forget there's almost like a moat around the mm. stadium. It's almost like you're going to South American football match. It's that kind of you're playing in Buenos Aires, you're playing against the Pumas, and you're playing in a football stadium. Um, and again, Ben Lamb just gives him a tiny shove in the back. Doesn't mean to push him over the hoardings at all, but he skips over himself, almost not knowing, or he clearly doesn't know what's on the other side. And luckily he landed well, but geez, that could have gone seriously wrong. If he decided to jump another way or he'd been pushed slightly harder by Ben Lamb, it could have been curtains, but no, that was not. It was funny. It's funny now we can look back, but at the time you could hear even the French commentary team watching here in France and giving it the fuck and then <laughs> covering because they're seriously worried for this guy's health. Um, so no, now we can laugh about it. Um, but yeah, crazy stuff could have really ended differently. The dangers of playing rugby in France. We could do a whole episode on that in future. <laughs> yes, we could. Well, La Rochelle were the other French winners in round one at home to Glasgow, but last season's finalists were made to work hard for it. And we can have a chat now with their fly half. Ehi West joins us. How are you? Yeah. Hey guys. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Tell us what was the feeling after the game? Yeah, it was a mixed sort of feeling, obviously happy with the, with the win and the four points, but um, like you said, they, they made us work really hard for it and um, we probably didn't perform at the level we know we can and um, probably left a few points out there. Um, but yeah, obviously the four points is the most important thing and uh, we got there in the end. But yeah, like you said, first 20, 30 minutes, we really, really struggled to get into the game and adjust to um, obviously a different competition. Um, Different refing. I think our, our discipline was pretty poor, especially in that first 20, 30 minutes. Um, but yeah, like you said, Glasgow put us under a lot of pressure. They held on to the ball for long periods of time and we had to make a lot of tackles. And um, into that first half, we slowly sort of worked our, worked our way back into the game and um, yeah, managed to get a result. You did very well in this competition last season up until the final. So just take us back to then. And obviously the sending off didn't help, but did, did that make it easier to take in the final or, or more difficult? Because you you were really impressive in that final, but just obviously came up just short. Yeah, it was obviously, um, you know, we did so well in the competition and to get there and uh, to have the final go like it was, it was obviously disappointing for everyone. Um, you know, we took obviously took, took the lessons from it and uh, went back in the top 14, but... Yeah, just to lose two finals in one year was obviously disappointing and it's uh, it's sort of hard to look back on and, you know, yeah, obviously you have regrets and stuff like that. But, um, you know, it was good to get back into the, the, the competition and um, obviously get off to a winning start, which is which is the most important thing. So, yeah, we take the, we take the lessons from last season's um, defeats in the finals and um, take what we can, the good and the bad, and move forward and hopefully learn from it um, moving forward this season. And what would be some of those learning points? Because obviously Ronan O'Gara is your coach at La Rochelle, a guy who has a huge history with the competition as well. Have there been any key points from the reviews that stood out? And, and more generally, what's he like as a coach? Because we hear so much again over with Irish press, not too much in French press, but generally as a bloke and as a coach, his detail, what's he like? Um, yeah, he's, he's awesome, Roger. I think he's a real, he's real positive around the group. Like he always he wants to get the best out of the players and he always, he's always lifting us up, like um, making the boys see like what sort of group we've got and what we can do with the ball and without the ball with defence as well. So he's really big into, you know, really getting the boys confident and um, backing us on the field with what we do. Um, and yeah, like you said, he's got a, 
massive history in the competition as well. So we can we can take learnings from his. Uh, he actually, like he's talked about as well. He's lost he's lost his first two finals as well. So um, obviously we didn't want to be we didn't want to do that, but we did. Um, so obviously that's another thing we can fall back on is because he bounced back and won two or three, I think. I'm not too sure. Well, he bounced back and won anyway. So obviously that's another thing we can um, look back onto him. And yeah, he's uh, clarity is a big part of him of what he brings as well and I think that helps massively with the with the team and our attack like everyone knows what we're trying to do everyone knows their role in the system if you're not in if you're not doing your job it's easy to tell when the review and stuff so it makes it a lot more easy when a review comes around so it just makes you want to do your job and on the field you know so yeah Roger's been awesome um the two and a two and a bit years he's been been with the club and it looks as well your detail the stuff that you mentioned the the minutiae that on both sides of the ball there's two or three sides in the top 14 that are extremely well organized. You've got Toulouse, yourselves, Bordeaux, a couple of others, but you guys are absolutely up there. What would you say that would be the differences between Jono, who left at the end of last season, and Rog in terms of style, personalities as well, and on field? Has it changed drastically or has it just been minor tweaks? Um, no, it hasn't, it hasn't changed drastically. I think, um, you know, it all started, we've sort of just followed on from the last couple of seasons, just just with a little bit more, more detail on who does what and who does do us this but I think uh yeah obviously when Rod uh, when Johnny was here sorry Rod was still you know he was the man that was doing all our attack and all our structure and stuff like that so this season it's no different he's obviously he's just he's got more of a role now because he's the he's the head honcho he's the he's the big dog so we know that everything that he runs everything now so but as opposed to uh, I mean our attack and our, our game it's sort of similar to how we how we tried to play last season just with a little bit more structure and a little bit more detail around who who goes where in, in our structure and things like that and what's it like having someone who's been so successful in your position as well as a head coach is it a big help or does he have higher expectation of you or is it a bit of both i think it's a bit of both but uh yeah i enjoy it i mean like we said before going back to the finals he he always tells me, you know, like he, his first final, he was, he missed five kicks or something like that. And obviously I struggled in the final last year with my goal kicking. So to be able to have someone like that, who, like we said, bounced back and did what he did in, in rugby is, is awesome. And I can always, you know, I can always go and ask him for tips and, uh, and advice and stuff like that. And, you know, we have a pretty good relationship when it comes to that sort of stuff with goal kicking, but not just goal kicking, like the whole game and, um, and running a team and and how he wants a team to run the game and how he looks at the game because it's a, it's actually funny obviously the way Rod sort of played was he was a big kicking team and stuff like that but the way he thinks about the game and the way he likes his team to play is sort of how I like to play is a bit more um, ability to run the ball and um, play with a bit more ambition and things like that so yeah it's it's been awesome having having him as coach. I was going to say, is it a combination, a meeting of minds almost? Because you are quite different in styles from the outside, looking you and you and Rene Gara. So, do you have quite a lot of chats about that, about the way he wants to approach the game, the way you want to approach the game, and almost meet in the middle a little bit? Yeah, definitely. But um, yeah, like I said, I, I feel I think that he looks at the game as a coach a lot different to how he played it. Like obviously, like I said, he was a lot of it. He was a big kicking ten and field position and playing in the right areas and. Um, and I've learned a lot from that as well. But like the way he thinks about the game now is he's got a real attacking mindset, I think. And he backs us to play what we see in front of us. Um, he gives us the structures and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, if we see a picture in front of us, then he backs us to pull the trigger with whatever that is. So it's, um, so it's definitely a balancing act, like you said. But um, yeah, we do have a lot of conversations and we try and find out you know, what's the best for the team each week moving forward. And it wasn't the easiest of starts. Obviously, you lost that first home game of the season to Toulouse after losing the two finals to them last year as well, which must have been a real bugger. Um, so that being his first game in charge, was it like a riot act read after it? Was it pretty harsh words? And Because it seems since then, your performances have steadily got better and better, and now you're absolutely firing. So it must have been quite strange for him as his first role as head coach and the first games didn't go too well. So how was it managed internally? And, and, and clearly now you're on the right path. So what's been said and what's been changed? Yeah, it was it was a tough start to the season. We, I think we actually lost our first three on the trot. So obviously it was a tough uh, 
initiation for Rod and the and the big the big role the head honcho. So um, yeah, there was the odd time when he he he, he lost the lost it out, but within reason. And obviously, the pictures of the games backed it up, so we can you know argue with what he was saying. What he was saying was right. So um, we knew it was easy to see what we were doing wrong and why we weren't getting the results. And then obviously, when you've got coaching staff with Rog and the and the likes that we do have they'll be able to fix that and show us what we need to be doing and stuff like that. And, you know, we slowly, slowly sort of walked, worked our way around. We're sort of trying to get back to where we were and um, we've put some good performances together since the start of the season. But um, again, we haven't been as consistent, I think, as we may have liked. We've dropped a couple of games away that we probably shouldn't have. The Perpignan game and Star Front say we're in a good position and ended up losing. So, it's all about consistency. Um, we know we're not going to win every game of the season, but if our performance is at a close to top level as we can, then um, hopefully the results will come. And this is the first time we've had somebody on from La Rochelle. So we really want to find out a bit about the club as well. You've obviously got some massive specimens, some like ridiculously good rugby players, but who are the sort of core group of boys that drive the squad? You've also got Roman Sazzi as your captain, but you've got Victor Vito. You've got some massive names around the squad. Who are the big names in different ways? Like who's driving culture, values? Who are the funny guys in the change room? Who are the characters? Can you give us a little bit about behind the scenes and the squad? Yeah, for sure. I think, yeah, well, like you talked about, the guys that sort of run the culture and stuff like that are the guys that have been around, you know, a long time. We've got Roman Sazi, who's played over 250 games, I think, for the club. Obviously, Wingy Antonio, he's played over 200 as well. And um, he's awesome because he's, obviously, he's from New Zealand. He's been in France for... 10 years, 10 plus years. So he's a good... Um, he came over when they were in Pro do Like, it's yeah. that long ago. Yeah. Amazing. So, yeah. So the likes of those guys have been been with the club since those Pro do days where they, you know, they built up, they won Pro do they come up to top 14, had a few tough years. And now, you know, the last few years have, we've managed to get a few results. So yeah, the likes of those two, Kevin Gordon as well. He's one of the, he's the same. He's been around for, since the Pro do days. And then... Obviously, Greg Aldred as well. He's our captain this year. He he leads a lot of it, and he's he's been awesome. Um, he's only young, but he he leads us on the field and in and around training and meetings and stuff. He's always talking. And then, obviously, like you, you mentioned, Victor Vito as well. Him and Tawada, they um, they are part of the leadership group as well, and they lead lead a lot of the stuff on field as well. And uh, yeah, so we've got a good, an awesome leadership group that uh, lead us well, and they. They link well with Rog and the, the coaches, the coaching staff as well. And um, you say the clowns and the clowns in the team. <laughs> There's a few. I think uh, Wingy would actually have to be up there as well. He's <laughs> every meeting, like there'll be reviews and stuff, and it'll be a serious talk, and then he'd just happen to say something or take the Mickey out of someone, and everyone just bursts out laughing. So he'd be up there. Will Skelton as well. He's uh, he loves to take take the piss out of people here and there. Um, you're not going to argue with those two either, are you? Like, if you're <laughs> Roger. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're, just laughing. you're taking that on the chin and just, just laughing away. But, um, yeah, those two would have to be the ones that uh, get the get the laughs in the, in the change room and things like that. And speaking of off the field, is there a, a Joe to Corey? Someone are you are trying to keep up with on a night out? Ooh. There's a few. I'd, I'd have to say Wingy as well. Like, he's just... <laughs> he's getting a lot of shout-outs today. Just everything, like, yeah, like, we call him like the king of La Rochelle just because everyone loves him here. Like he's the president's son. Everyone in the <laughs> everyone in the city loves him. The crowd loves him, and all the boys love him as well. So he'd have to be our our sort of Joe to Corey, I think. And as a tad, Johnny mentioned it. What is it like playing behind a pack that's got Winnie Antonio and Will Skelton in it? It must be must be good at times. Yeah, like yeah, it's awesome. Like it's impossible for them not to win the game line. And obviously as a 10, as a back line, it's so much easier when the ball's, when you're moving forward onto the ball. And um, yeah, to have the guys like that, you know, you have a ruck and you give the ball to Wingy. The next ruck, you've got Will Skelton carrying the ball. One next, you've got Greg Alger um, carrying the ball. So as nines and tens, it just makes it so much easier when you've got the likes of those guys in a forward pack. Um, even when it comes to scrum time, like, the way that our boys um, scrum goes forward is just is just crazy. So um, yeah, I'm just definitely loving playing behind a, a pack like that. 
and then you follow that up with giving it to Lavani Botia or Jonathan Dante. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so it must be, again, in terms of systems and, and go forward ball and be able to manipulate defences, it must be a dream to be part of that side for the minute. It must be great fun. Yeah, that's awesome. And like you mentioned, with the structures and stuff, you know, like of a scrum, obviously a scrum, like we see going forward and then you give the ball to, to Lips or Joe Dante and they're getting five, 10 metres over the gain line and then you just play on front football and, you know, everything else, the whole field just opens up for you. So, um, yeah, to be able to have the guys that we have in our team is awesome. And it's just about making sure, like we said at the start, going back to our structures, making sure that we all know our roles. Everyone's doing their roles so that it gives the likes of, Greg or Will or Leps and the likes of those those guys one on ones and the ability to be able to beat defenders and get over the game line and open up our whole game. So yeah, it's 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 pretty special. And just a quick one on Will Skelton. Has he really got size nineteen feet? He must have boots like flippers. That crazy. I think he's yeah size 18, 18 US. Okay. So once, but they look twenty something. All the boys <laughs> are always putting their boots on and then putting his boots on top of them, so <laughs> yeah, his feet are ridiculous. Well, his whole, he's, a, he's just a massive human. He's a dump truck, mate. He is a freak show, but yeah. fit and very, very good. I wanted to ask you again, I've seen before you talked about your inspirations as a 10 growing up and the people you want to emulate. So King Carlos back home, and you always enjoyed the style of Aaron Cruden, who was over here for a while too. In terms of French 10s, there's a few kicking around. How, how highly do you rate the crop of French 10s that are kicking around the top 14 right now? Yeah, I think it's awesome. I think there's a lot of depth in French rugby at the moment. I think um, French rugby is in a good place. And obviously you don't have to look too far back. And, and that was the game against the All Blacks where we managed to see that um, all fall into place. But yeah, the depth that they've got at number 10 at the moment is is awesome. And obviously um, Roman Intermac and Mitch Jellybe are at the top of that list. And um, the way they play rugby is is awesome. Like it's, they can do, you know, anything that, good kickers of the ball, good goal kickers. They take the line on. They've got great passes. Um, they run the game very well, and they're, they're both solid in defence. So I think, um, yeah, French rugby um, in a whole is in a good place, and, and tens as well is a, is a long list. But not only those two, there's a lot of a lot of young tens coming through as well. Likes of Louis Carbonel, uh, Antoine Hastoy, um, Antoine Joubert, the one young one from racing, he's a, he's a good player as well. So... Yeah, I think there's a long list of teams in French rugby at the moment, which is only good, only good for the, the, the team moving forward. You mentioned that depth. The big news over the past couple of weeks has been World Rugby's eligibility ruling. You're staying in France for a while now. If you got the call, would you entertain it as a possibility? Yeah, I'd, I'd 100% entertain it. Um, like my wife and I, we're loving loving the life in France, France at the moment. And um, yeah, like you said, we've been here. This is my fourth season now, so it's still um, still a year and a bit away. But I don't know, I'm 29 now, so I'll be maybe 31, 32. So um, we had, I don't know what will happen. But yeah, if it, the chance came, I'd definitely entertain it. And the place, La Rochelle. Again, you're a first boy on from La Rochelle. What is the town like? You mentioned Winnie Antonio is the, is the king of La Rochelle, the president's son. But... In terms of a town to play your rugby in, it's got a crazy support. Like you've got one of the best crowds in the top 14. But in terms of the town, the culture, the people, how have you enjoyed it? Yeah, like I said, we're loving the life of France. And obviously, La Rochelle has been a massive part of that. Um, like you said, the crowds that we get at the games, it's just, it's just crazy. Like I never experienced anything like that. Um, I heard about it. Like when I signed, I heard, I heard whispers, you know, like the crowds over there are crazy. You're going to love it. And I was like, yeah, okay, but... When you actually experience it, it's like there's nothing else. It's 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 crazy, and even you know around the town and stuff, all the towns behind the team and they're, they're great fans. Obviously, we lost two finals last year, but they're all 100% behind us. You know, you go up town for a, for a coffee or a beer or something, and everyone's you know wishing you luck for the games and the weekend and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, it's an awesome awesome place to live in a in a, in a really nice town. And how big a decision was it to come over? Because I think you got the offer a year before you actually came, didn't you? And you waited a year, then made the call. Uh, and obviously, it's a long way to come. Nowadays, it's very difficult, impossible to get back home. Do you look back on it and think one of the best decisions you made? Yeah, definitely. Um, like you said, the, the offer did come one year earlier. 
and um, we hummed and hard a bit, and then we decided that we weren't quite quite ready to leave 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 home and leave New Zealand. So we we stayed one more year, and then um, we thought that would be it. We'd have to you know look for another club or things like that. But we went back to them, and they were still still interested, and you know we were ready to leave and experience a different culture and a different lifestyle. And um, yeah, when we got over here, we just we just loved it. So looking back on it now, I, I wish I came that that year earlier. Um, but, you know, we're here now. We've been here for, this is our fourth season and, and we're loving life in France. So, yeah, definitely one of the best decisions we've made. And Tim alluded to earlier, but obviously leaving La Rochelle at the end of this season, you signed three years at Toulon. There's a lot of moving pieces. Tens have all started to move around the top 14. So congratulations. That's an amazing move. Toulon yeah, will be yes. great fun and to secure three years as well. That's phenomenal. How did that move come about and how much are you looking forward to getting there? Um. Yeah, well, obviously, uh, La Rochelle, they've signed, they signed a, a 10 for next year, um, Hestoy, and they, they, weren't, they weren't too sure whether they wanted, wanted to keep me or not, and um, they sort of said, oh, we can't, we're not ready to make a decision. So, well, obviously, we went out and checked what was out there, and, um, yeah, and Toulon came, and they were really, really interested. They showed us, um, you know, that they, they really wanted us, and there was... It was a it was a pretty easy, easy decision to be honest. Obviously, like you said, it's not not the worst uh, worst spot to live in in France. I've heard, and um, the club at the moment I think is in a in a pretty exciting time um, with the sort of playing group they've got together. Obviously, Frank Frank Azema coming in and taking over. Um, I've heard good things about him, and yeah, it was a pretty easy decision. They offered you know a three year deal, which is which is awesome for us to secure our future and. Um, like I said, we're loving the life in France, so we wanted to wanted to stay here. And um, yeah, we, we're definitely looking forward to to the move at the end of the season. And were there other offers on the table from abroad as well, or did you have your heart set on staying in the top four team? Yeah, our heart was definitely um, uh, stuck on staying in France. There was, you know, a few offers from from the UK and and whatnot, but we weren't were too keen to go and spend spend our uh, whole year in the in the cold and the wet. Um, and, and Japan was an option, but not really. Like we, like I said, we we love the the life here in France, and we're loving the French culture. So um, when Toulon came, it was um, we we're very excited. And it must be in terms of a a change. So, so La Rochelle is very settled, whereas Toulon looks like it's going through a transition as well. You mentioned uh, the coaching change, Frank Azema's coming in, but the personnel they've got: Colby, Etzebeth, Parise. The names are phenomenal. So it must be really exciting for you to go in and almost as a project think really improve this club because performances have not been good this year and you could be one of the key pieces next year that really encourage them to flourish. Yeah, 100%. I think, um, yeah, like I said, it's definitely an exciting time. Well, I think it's definitely an exciting time for the club. Um, some of the players that you mentioned is just, you know, they've got some ridiculous talent there. Um, I think they just signed YC as well from Star France as well that came out today. He's another... Massive signing for the club. Um, and yeah, like I've only heard good things about Frank Azema as well and him taking over. So um, yeah, hopefully we can, um, you know, go on there and start getting some results and get back to the, the Toulon of all. Because that was another thing too, which made the decision um, pretty easy to go to Toulon. Like growing up in New Zealand, um, you know, Toulon and Toulouse are like the clubs you sort of associate to French rugby and um those were, you know, back in the days when Johnny was there and they were winning, you know, championships, you know, left, right and centre. And um, So to have the chance to, to be able to play for that club or hopefully play for that club is, is something, yeah, that's definitely exciting. You signed a three-year contract there, so that'll take you to seven years in, in France. At some point, have you thought about taking a French citizenship test? Are you going to stay on after that or is the plan to go home eventually? Um, yeah, we've definitely talked about the um, French citizenship. Uh, myself and uh, Raymond Rule, we've actually started our, well, restarted some French lessons just to work towards um, getting the B1. I think you need for uh, for citizenship and the passport. So, yeah, that's um, slowly slowly taking place in the background. Um, obviously, a bit of work to do on that, but yeah, it's definitely something that uh, my wife and I would love to love to hopefully be able to do one day. Johnny, any tips? Just get studying, mate. The Delft B1. We've all been through it. The yeah. Delft B1. Get to your local language school. Get studying. Mate, it's not that bad. You'll be able to crack it. You've been here long enough. It'll be easy. Um, mate, you fancy coaching afterwards? Again, long list of 10s. You've got Rog there that's 
showing you the ropes. His transition as well has been fairly straightforward. Would you fancy coaching afterwards? And if so, would that be in France or do you want to head back home to earn those coaching stripes? I'm not too sure. Um, originally, well, the last couple of years, I've originally thought, no, like uh, coaching is not for me. But, um, you know, the older I get and the, um, the later into my career, I get it's sort of something I may consider. I'm not too sure. I don't think being like a head coach or something is for me. Maybe like a, you know, backs coach or a skills coach or something like that would be something I'd get into. But, um, yeah, it's not high on my list at the moment. So I'm not too, not too sure. If, if we'll get, go down the coaching route or not. And bringing it back to the Champions Cup, um, you touched on it earlier on, the criticism that you personally got after the final last year and, and your goal kicking. I know that comes with the territory as a as a kicker, but it can take its toll, can't it? Yeah, 100%. Um, obviously, like you said, it comes with the territory being a goal kicker. You know, you, you, you grow up, you know, thinking about those moments and stuff like that. And um, so obviously not probably perform where you should be in the, in the big games is obviously disappointing and uh, it takes a, takes a toll. But um, like I said before, you obviously there's nothing I can do about it now. You know, it's, it's gone, it's past, I can't go back and change it. So it's just all about learning from it, learning from those experiences. And hopefully if we get a, if I get another chance in another final, then to be able to be better, um, that's all I can do. And obviously people will say what they will say. And that's happened throughout my whole career. You know, it doesn't, uh, I think when I was a bit younger, it, it really probably affected me a bit more than it does now. Um, uh, but now I've learned to deal with it. You know, people are going to say stuff no matter if you're man of the match or if you have a, have a shocker. So, um, yeah, all I need to worry about is my performance and my teammates and, 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 and coaching stuff. Does it make the fire burn even harder to, to go again this season to, to prove that, you know, everyone has an off day? And also, we we mentioned, or you mentioned Johnny Wilkinson earlier on. Um, what kind of a personality are you? Because he would have been out four thirty the next morning, kicking hundred balls. Are you that kind of guy, or do you give yourself a bit of a break? Um, I think I was out at four thirty the next morning, but probably drinking away my sorrows. <laughs> <laughs> not down at the field uh, kicking. I was, you know, with the boys drinking beer, just feeling feeling sorry for myself. Um, but yeah, like you said, it definitely. Um, the fire's burning to to do all all I can individually and all we can as a team to hopefully put ourselves back into that position and have a chance to to play um, finals rugby because at the end of the day that's that's why you play the game is to is to win titles and um, you know it's my last season here and it would be it'd be awesome to to win a win the first win a first title for for this club before I leave. It would be awesome because the story has been amazing to watch. From Pro Do to where you are now, the, the brand of rugby, the quality of rugby, the stadium, the crowd is built so nicely. Um, obviously, again, great win against Glasgow at the weekend. You go to Bath this weekend, who are struggling in the Premiership. What do you need to get right? Like Again, you might have an opportunity with, with knockout football again this year, but what do you need to get right going into the game this weekend in Bath? Yeah, like you said, they've um, obviously been struggling, but we know it's obviously a new competition for them and it's, it's the second game of the competition. So, you know, one one good performance from them can can turn their season around. So we're not taking them lightly at all. We um, have obviously taken the lessons. We had a good review today of our game against Glasgow and um, we've taken the lessons on board and, and and we've had a little bit of a look at Bath as well. So I think uh, if we play how we can and we get uh, the things right that we need to uh, from our game last week, then uh, we can give ourselves a chance to to get a good win. But like I said, it's obviously... It's, it's still going to be tough, obviously, away from home in in uh, in Bath um, against a team that's obviously, like you said, struggling. But you know, they want to do all they can to 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 turn their season around, and um, we just need to be make sure it's it's not us that they turn their season around against. Well, thanks so much for coming on and giving us an insight into the La Rochelle journey. And fingers crossed, you can go one step further this year. No worries. Thanks for having me, guys. Pleasure, mate. Thanks very much. Cheers, boys. Interesting, that. Another converted Frenchman, Johnny. Uh, and a really, really good player. Um, and just great to have somebody from La Rochelle on. We've actually had a few others lined up who probably join us in the new year. So Big Will Skelton, Greg Aldrit. Um, but just great to have some insight into the club because they've been doing so well and consistently so well over the past three, four, five seasons. Um, and he's been a part of that. He's been a huge part of that, the way he's played the game. 
Uh, again, he's had great pack around him, great players around him, but he's been integral and he's a great bloke as well. So really good of him to join us, give us some insight into the club um, so that we could learn a little bit more. So hope everyone enjoyed that one too. Right. It's about time we did our meter moment of the week, isn't it? So do you want us to talk us through it, Johnny? Our meter moment of the week is the best rugby moment of the weekend. Um, and for me this weekend, Tim, it was fairly straightforward given the week that we had in the rugby world last week. Antoine Dupont being named the World Player of the Year for 2021. He got my vote. I think he got Benji's vote. He got your vote. He got everyone's vote. Um, but to then get that award, and I know we said it was a slightly different opposition um, against Cardiff, but still the caliber of the performance, the assists, the tackle breaks, the fends, the gas, the cross heel kicks to set up tries from the base of rucks. Um, he absolutely did it all. So my meter moment of the week and weekend is Antoine Dupont being named the Rugby Player of the Year for 2021 and his performance again against Cardiff at the weekend for Toulouse. I thought you were going to give it to the recruitment consultant and the primary school teacher just for keeping up with it. <laughs> for giving up the dream. Don't give up the dream. That was Johnny's meter moment of the week. And keep an eye out as well for a competition on our social media in the coming days to be in with a chance of winning one of the world's number one wireless meat thermometers in time for Christmas. Meter have made over 9 million cooks better with their thermometers and revolutionary app as well. So it's no surprise their users are growing rapidly every day. You can use them on a barbecue, in the oven, or in a pan. So just check out meter.com to get your hands on one and enter a whole new world of cooking. And just use the code FRENCHPOD10 at checkout for 10% off any full price item as well. Let's have a look ahead to round two of the Champions Cup now then. And news coming out that there's been a few cases of COVID in the Montpellier camp and after their result in round one, I mean, the game could be in the balance if it's on. Do you think they could give Leinster a run for their money or are they going to be 0-2? So they've had five cases so far declared um, as it stands on Tuesday night as we're recording, five cases and it doesn't look good. And I think that does throw the game into jeopardy. And I think as well, once Montpellier start making force changes, it gets tough because Leinster were very, very good last weekend. We know how good they are, both home and away in this competition. Um, so you hope, again, the game goes ahead, even though if that means throwing in academy kids, you throw in academy kids, you play the fixture, you fulfil it. But I think that might just mean that Leinster will be a bit too strong for Montpellier this weekend. When you were in cast for round one, they'll be disappointed with how it went against Quinns. But Munster severely depleted still this weekend uh, what kind of team do you think they'll be sending do you, do you give them a chance in Munster or not it's a really weird one because they were they were they were fairly down on themselves after that loss that's the first time they've lost a Champions Cup game at home since 2015 it's the first time they lost in cast in 2021 um, and I'm not sure they, they fully grasped the situation of Munster. I was trying to explain it to them and what's happened with South Africa and the fact that people are quarantined and people won't be available, but I, I'm not quite sure they had their heads around it. They thought, well, there's no point sending, there's no point going fully, um, fully armed to the teeth with our full strength. If we're going to play Munster away in Munster, we'll probably lose the game. But I was like, boys, like <laughs> actually they've got the situation where they've got kids and they've got a million people that aren't playing. So, you know, stick out your best side. So it'll be really interesting to see what selection they go with if they pick their full noise and they go with the first 15, first 23, there's absolutely a great chance they could pick up a win on the road. Um, and that'd be a really famous win going to Munster for cast and winning in Munster. Whether that's the case or whether they have one eye on the top 14 after losing that opener against Harlequins, we'll wait and see. But again, the fact that you can lose a home game and with this new format, you can go in and still pick up points on the road. Um, it makes it really interesting. So Pierre-Henri Broncon has got a decision to make probably tonight tomorrow morning before he names that team on Thursday. Um, but yeah, they absolutely could do something on the road this weekend if they decide to do so. And what have some of the other fixtures involving the French teams in round two than any that you'd pick out? Um, I think racing to back up um, that big win at Northampton. I think they could school the Ospreys uh, in Paris this weekend. That Bordeaux one away to the Scarlets, that's a big game for them as well. I think they'll be looking to win that one on the road. Uh, to lose against Wasps. Wasps, again, I think they've still got 17, 18, potentially 19 people out with injury. So you're looking again for five points for Wasps. That, again, you just never know how that's going to play out in the knockout stages because they're clearly going to go through. But having played against weakened opposition in all of their pool matches, that 
that's not good prep. Um, you've got Stad Frontier against Bristol. Again, you've got to think Stad Frontier are going to mix that team up and probably aren't going to take it too seriously. So you're thinking Bristol are probably going to do well in Paris. Um, and the big game for me, which could be a real deciding moment in their season, is Sale versus Clermont. You, again, you just don't know where you're going to get with Clermont. But we saw last year they went on the road and they beat Wasps away. But Sale are a very good side as well um, and hard to break down. So, look, there's interesting fixtures um, the whole way through the weekend and everybody's still got something to play for. So, um, no, a good weekend of rugby ahead of us. And one other bit of news outside of all things Champions Cup, which is interesting for us because we had him on in one of the first few episodes of this podcast yep. and he was telling us then he still wanted to play for Italy. Yep. Wind the clock forward 18 months, headlines coming out, Sergio Parise still available for Italy in the Six Nations. Do you expect him to be there? Well, 100%. And why would you not? Why would you not pick him? And for him as well, it's his last season of rugby. He's announced this is going to be his last year moving into coaching afterwards, they've got to pick him. They've got to pick him. It doesn't, I mean, building towards World Cups, he's still on form. He's still performing week in, week out for too long. He's still exceptional, one of the best eights in the world. So if you're looking for a point of difference, an X factor and a leader, which he is, you've got to get him involved. He's world class. Um, and as you mentioned, one of our earliest pods, so if you're listening, go back through the back catalogue and listen to Sergio Prisa, who you don't normally get to hear talk in English. Um, because he was really interesting and uh, yeah, an absolute legend. So, fingers crossed, he will be back in blue for Italy over the next few months. There we go. We'll see him again in February and March and maybe get him back on, have a chat about how it went. Thanks, Johnny. A big thanks to Ehio West for joining us as well today. And thanks to all of you guys for listening. Make sure you hit subscribe, leave us a nice review if you can as well. Check us out on Rugby Pass and on YouTube. And we'll be back with another episode next week. Au revoir, Johnny. Cheers, Tim. Bye.